Hello everyone and welcome to the first of two webinars today from Cambridge University Press ELT. I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Jack Richards as today's presenter. Professor Richards is an internationally renowned specialist in language acquisition, an applied linguist and educator, and the author of numerous professional texts and widely used course books, including Interchange, which is actually the course book I used when I first started teaching English 17 years ago. So it's always a great pleasure for me to be working with, with Jack on a webinar. He's also the author of an exciting new book, Key Issues in Language Teaching, which provides a comprehensive overview of the field of English language teaching informed by theory, research, and practice, really useful for student teachers at graduate and postgraduate level. So I'll hand you over to, to Jack now. OK, over to you, Jack. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me wherever you are. I see there's a, a number of... Uh, uh, participants, we've got nearly a hundred so far from many different countries. So it's it's great to have the chance to to uh, talk with you today. And uh, as you know, the, the topic um, has to do with the the role of uh, out of class learning, language learning beyond the classroom. So um, before I get into the topic, I'd like to start with a few thoughts and uh, reflections on um, how language teaching has changed in recent years. If we look back at the history of language teaching prior to the World Wide Web. The main context for learning for many learners was the classroom, particularly in contexts where we referred to English as a foreign language, where there wasn't much use of English in the community at large, and the classroom provided the main source of input for language learning. And that was true for most of the world's populations, most of the large countries with large populations like China and Brazil and Mexico and so on. For many learners in countries like these, the classroom was the main context for learning. And so there was a, a, a huge um, pressure to make the classroom as authentic as possible, to make learning in the classroom resemble what happened when people went out of the classroom, if they ever did. And for many learners, the only contact they had with English was in the classroom. And so the language teaching up to the period of the World Wide Web, a lot of attention was given to making classroom language uh, authentic through the use of corpus research, for example, making activities authentic through a communicative language teaching methodology and through tasks and uh, realia and so on. So the idea was that the classroom was to be a little miniature world, if you like, and um, methodology, in a sense, was concerned with micromanaging classroom processes to create opportunities for authentic interaction. Now, of course, since the advent of the internet, for many learners, it's actually not the classroom that's the primary source of contact with English. It's outside of the classroom, beyond the classroom. And so we have this concept of the flipped classroom, that um, when you talk to learners today, when you research learners contact with English and other languages out of the, uh, in, in their lives these days, much of their input comes from outside of the classroom. And so today I want to look at uh, some examples of what teachers do to enable students to participate from out of class learning experiences. So the first point I just want to make in passing is that language teaching has changed. And while the classroom is still a very important uh, source, a starting point for language learning, um, and while we want to make the classroom as authentic as possible as a context for language use, for many learners, it's just a small part of their total language learning experience. The second point I want to make comes from some anecdotal observations I've been traveling in the last couple of months in, for example, in Scandinavia, in Finland and Norway and uh, Sweden, where I've spent some weeks. Uh, I, I have often spent periods of time there. Right now, I'm in South Korea, where I'll be for the next few weeks. Um, now, if we compare the learning and the use of English in those two parts of the world, there's an important observation that we can make. First of all, in Northern Europe, it's very uh, common to meet people from all walks of life, particularly young people, people who've been uh, through to the uh, secondary school education and perhaps beyond that. It's perfectly normal to be able to have a conversation in English with those kinds of people. And more often than not, they tell you that one of the primary sources they, uh, they count on for the learning of English has been through films and, and television. 
And they also point out that in those Northern European countries, films are not dubbed. They watch them in the language of origin and they are given subtitles um, in the mother tongue. And so from a very early age, they are receiving a huge amount of input in, in English. Now, in Korea, um, it's very rare to meet people of a similar age group who have any fluency in English, despite a huge investment in the teaching of English in countries like South Korea. And, and yet, many movies and television programs here are also shown in the language of origin with subtitles. So why is it that in the Northern European countries that seems to be a source for learning, and yet in a country like South Korea it doesn't? I think to understand that issue, you need to understand the difference between input and intake. Input is anything we hear that could prove a source for language learning. And so um, if, here I am today in Seoul, South Korea, and I'm um, traveling with uh, South Korean friends. I'm hearing a lot of Korean language. It's input. I don't know any Korean la language, however, so I'm unable to learn from anything that I hear. So the input I receive does not serve as intake. Intake is that which we receive that can serve as a trigger for language learning. So keep that distinction in mind between input and intake. For input to become intake, you have to have a base, you have to have a foundation. And that's one of the differences between uh, language learning opportunities beyond the classroom in this part of the world where I am today and in, for example, Northern Europe. In Northern Europe, the English that the learners get at school and from the community at large enables them to turn input into intake. In other words, they're able to learn from films and television and other sources of English because they already have a sufficient basis to be able to process and work with the language they hear, which is, does not appear to be the case of the learners here in South Korea. So that's the distinction I wanted you to start off with between input and intake, because when we're talking about the language learning beyond the classroom, we'll be looking at ways in which teachers and learners try to make use of opportunities outside of the classroom to turn input into intake as a source for language learning. Okay, so there have always been, of course, recognized that there are two important dimensions to successful second language learning. What goes on inside the classroom, and as I mentioned, that was up to the period of the World Wide Web, the primary source of language learning for many learners. And we tried to make classroom input as authentic as possible. And of course, what goes on outside of the classroom, the two are the primary sources of learning. But today, what's happened in today's world, of course, or in the last 20 years or so, is that there are now totally different opportunities available for out-of-class learning that were simply not available um, some years back. Internet, technology, media, social media, and so on are becoming increasingly available to more and more learners and um, occupy, a hu occupy a huge portion of their time and can serve as an important source of language learning, of language input, and can also serve as intake. Now, I want to look at examples from five different areas where um, language use outside of the classroom, contact with language outside of the classroom, can serve to facilitate language learning. I'm going to look at um, developing communicative skills through using English as a medium interaction, and some examples there. Um, we're going to look at examples that focus on the, the different skill areas, reading, writing, listening, uh, the use of technology, um, collaboration on projects, and uh, television as a learning resource. And the examples that I'm going to share with you come mainly from a couple of recent books uh, on this area that uh, I will share with you at the end of the presentation. So I want to start then with developing communicative skills through using English as a medium of interaction. And um, to give you some examples from um, researchers who've looked at different aspects of these sources of learning. The first is chat rooms. And many of them, many of us, of course, participate in different kinds of chat rooms. And one of the easiest ways for learners to engage in real 
communication out of classes through an online chat room. And these enable people with similar interests to interact either through written text-based messages or in a spoken medium. And they're organized often by topics and there are literally thousands of them on the internet. Some are intended specifically for language learners at different levels of proficiency and enable learners to use their English language resources to engage in real-time communication and interaction with other language learners as well as with native speakers. One of the differences between chat room communication that seems to make it um, valuable as a source of language learning is that whereas classroom-based communication in English is often stressful for learners because faces involved, sometimes making them unwilling to communicate or to try out their English, the chat room is really a, a stress-free context for the use of English. The, the participants are not handicapped by their limited English proficiency or their fear of making mistakes in front of their peers. Consequently, chat room interactions often result in more successful comprehension as well as a greater quantity of English language production than we get in classroom-based communication. And there are many published accounts of the nature of chat room discourse and how chat room participation can support out-of-class learning. Um, it uh, may not only raise awareness for the learners of um, language use, but provide opportunities for self-repair, for negotiation of meaning, and other uh, aspects of language learning that are important uh, sources of learning. Another source of out-of-class learning that provides a basis for learning through communication is through self-access centers. Now, they are, of course, an established feature of many educational institutions, but they're also found in community settings, for example, where they provide opportunities for learners to access a range of different language learning resources. Japan is a good example of a, a country where, uh, in a number of communities, self-access centers have been established for adult learners. Um, in uh, the case study by Gerald Murray, which uh, you'll see described in one of the books in the references I'll give you later, um, he talks about a small Japanese city in which uh, a self-access center was established to meet the needs of business people and other salaried workers who couldn't attend regular taught classes. The idea was to provide a stress-free context for using and learning English where learners could drop in practice using English within a supportive learning community and some of the key features were um, the learners who are mainly older folks identified their goals what they wanted to, to work on they chose materials decided on what they wanted to do as you can see there on the slide and the members learned through direct contact with different kinds of language materials including computer software, DVDs, and so on. And um, other things that they did in the Self-Access Center include conversation groups, workshops, and social events of different kinds. And so participants kept language learning portfolios containing their long-term learning plans, and which also included a reflective component. And one of the uh, success reasons, I think, for a self-access center of this kind um, is due to the fact that it's a, a social learning space. People get together for social reasons as well as uh, for learning uh, English and where the participants could feel relaxed and comfortable, willing to try out their English and to support each other's attempts uh, to use uh, English. As um, one of the folk uh, described in uh, talking about her experience in the language uh, self-access center she said the learners who are coming here our purpose is the same we can understand each other some members are older than me are very kind to me I like them that's one reason I like to come here and so on so an example there of uh, learning through social interaction in a self-access center now an activity we often use in um, and encourage our students to do is to go out and interview people, interview speakers of English and have an opportunity to use your English 
um, in that way. And I, from time to time, get stopped by students, most recently in Zurich, um, actually, where a young man stopped me on the street. And strangely enough, he had to interview me for an, an architecture project, not necessarily an English language project, but he was using English uh, as the basis of the interview. Anyway, um, interviewing, communicating with speakers of English, although commonly recommended as an out-of-class activity, can be threatening for many learners who feel sometimes embarrassed or awkward because of their limitations in the use of English. Um, Michael Legutke, uh, Le in one of the books that I will cite for you, describes how he and his colleagues addressed this issue in a program for student teachers in a German university. The student teachers worked with local high school students in a German city that had a large tourist population. And to prepare the high school students to interview foreigners, they were first trained in interview skills, and then they rehearsed the kinds of topics and questions they would use. They were taught um, how to use a microphone and a digital audio recorder. And so then they went off, um, interviewed uh, native speakers or other visitors to that city, but using English, and then um, they brought those uh, interviews back to class and talked about what they learned from them. And uh, one of the student teachers who worked with these uh, young high school kids commented here and said, as you see, when I listened to the interviews at home, I was quite impressed. I must say the students recorded very good interviews. I could notice they got more and more confident with each interview. In one of the last interviews, they even inserted questions they just thought of and which fit to their interview partner. They didn't only stick to the questions that uh, they'd been prepared. So we can say of this kind of activity that these interviews were very motivating for the high school students since through the experience they realized they actually were capable of maintaining an intelligent conversation with someone using English. And that's, that's, that sense of accomplishment is a real uh, threshold um, in language learning for many learners, I think, when they realize for the very first time, they are capable of maintaining an intelligent conversation with someone using English. Another opportunity to provide out of class situations that enable learners to try out and develop their communication skills is through what are called language villages. Some of you will be familiar with the notion of a language village. They um, have been established in various parts of Europe as well as in Asia, here in South Korea particularly, for example, and Japan. Um, in Spain, a typical language village experience for Spanish learners of English would consist of a period of residence, maybe a week, in a village setting. Other residents would be young native speakers from different English-speaking countries who are offered a free six-day Spain uh, stay in Spain, during which they stay in the village and help Spanish students to improve their conversational skills and English. Uh, and uh, the um, program in one of these village settings in Spain is described, as you see there, sessions start at nine with breakfast. Learners are paired each hour with a different native speaker for one-to-one -one activities in English, such as practicing telephone conversations, talking about common interests, and so on. Afternoon sessions included general group dynamic activities for team building and preparation for social activities um, in the evening after dinner, social activities including drama, the dreaded karaoke and telling jokes and so on. So in an intensive village experience such as this, learners have an opportunity to improve their language skills as well as their understanding of different cultures and they do so in a setting that's stress-free. So those um, four examples are all related to learning English out of class through situations that require genuine communication and interaction. And um, perhaps I could generalize a little from those before we move on to look at um, some other kinds of activities. What are some of the features that are specific to the activities I described? Um, I think one thing we can say of them is that um, often the language learning that results from them is not planned, but is incidental to other activities. This is 
perhaps true of chat rooms. Although some chat rooms are designed specifically to promote the use and mastery of English, but for many, um, the chat participation in the chat room has other purposes and learning of English can be, if you like, incidental. And similarly, in the case of the self-access center and the student interviews and also perhaps the language village, the experiences were designed specifically to provide language learning opportunities. And um, so those would perhaps be examples of intentional learning. Of course, these activities are also highly motivate, motivating. The learners were sustained by experiences they found motivating and fulfilling. And indeed, we find that students often spend extended periods of time in chat rooms since they serve both social as well as cognitive purposes. The, similarly, the German high school students are referred to reported that the interviewing activities were very motivating for them since they really discovered, perhaps for the first time, they actually could carry out a meaningful interaction with people in English. And some students who apparently had been shy and uncommunicative in class were much more willing to communicate during the interviews. Likewise, the um, adults in the self-access center, as well as the language village, similarly are reported to have developed confidence in using English since they participated in what you might call success oriented activities and not in a non-threatening supportive atmosphere. And of course, these activities are based on interaction. They involve learners in collaborative interaction and negotiation of meaning, which are important uh, processes in uh, second language learning. So each of them involve a social interaction. All right. Um, now I want to look at some activities that uh, focus on specific skill areas. Um, they are examples, if you like, of intentional learning, where there is a focus specifically on um, learning some particular aspect of one of the four skills, listening, speaking, reading, or writing. I'll start with um, some examples from the use of digital games. Many young people, as well as adults, play digital games, and these offer possibilities both for entertainment as well as language learning. My former colleague in Hong Kong, Alice Chick, who is now in um, Australia at um, Macquarie University, she describes in some of her research how digital gameplay can contribute to second language learning, particularly in developing familiarity with topics and vocabulary that may not be included in a regular language course. She followed a learner who wanted to move beyond the language of his uh, university studies to become more familiar with colloquial vocabulary and expressions needed to engage in conversations about the topic of sport. And um, to do this, he, as you can see there, started playing digital basketball games on his PC. And let me just leave you to read that slide for a second. As you read that, I'm looking at some of these um, interesting comments that you're um, sending to me here. Um, so th there you can see how this young man, he was a young student from China actually, um, through playing, uh, engaging in digital gameplay, was able to develop um, the language he needed to engage in conversation on the topic of sport. So this is an example of an out of class activity that's directed at a particular skill area, in this case, uh, conversation. Another colleague, uh, this one is Betsy Gilliland, and who's at the University of Hawaii, uh, describes uh, an activity she calls listening logs. I like this one very much because uh, she's trying to capitalize on ways of improving listening ability by having students move into the world and follow and monitor activities where they'll hear English. Here's how she describes it. Listening logs. Um, 
activity in which students document their participation in out-of-class activities reflect on how such participation helped their imp improve their listening abilities. So as you can see, she would have them attend a variety of real events. It, they might go to a museum and follow the guide as he or she takes visitors around the museum. Any situation where they would hear uh, uh, listening, uh, authentic input. And uh, these included not over, not only um, going to museums and things like that, but also um, TV comedies, uh, feature films, as well as lectures and uh, news broadcasts. So uh, then they wrote a listening log in which they included a brief summary of the event that they listened to, their personal response to the content. They reflected on the listening experience and in included a plan for improving their listening comprehension in the future and also recorded new idioms, expressions and vocabulary that they learned through the experience. So uh, I guess the important thing there is to help this, to direct the students towards an activity that uh, is of inter interest to them that uh, is at a level that they can cope with and then they monitor their participation in that activity through what Betsy calls a listening log. Um, now um, I want to now talk about uh, online resources like the um, TED Talks before I go into that uh, slide um, because uh, th there's a huge amount of um, input on the web in the form of spoken and written texts that has great potential for language learning. One of the most well-known, of course, uh, is the, the source known as TED Talks, um, which are high interest talks on almost every topic uh, of different lengths, different difficulty levels and genres. And they often include transcripts as well as translations into different languages. And people, students can listen to these and share reactions to them by posting messages. And some of the talks uh, available have received over 12 million views and they're being updated updated all the time. Um, now, this is from my colleague in Wellington, uh, Averill Coxhead, and um, who talks about the use of TED Talks as a learning resource. She says that learners can listen to before or after reading a transcript, choose short talks on topics they already know something about and so on. They can read the transcript of the talk and then listen in English. Um, now, uh, I recently heard a wonderful presentation by a colleague in Japan who talked about an English program he's developed for freshman English students in a Japanese uh, university in which he said, basically, I do no teaching. I just give the students things to do. One of the things he did with TED Talks, one of the things he does, he assigns the students during a semester to listen to 10 TED Talks on topics of their choice. They have to make um, a short PowerPoint presentation about the talk that they viewed, only using three or four slides. They come to class and they present their presentation to uh, other students in groups. And they also record their presentation in using some software that monitors their pronunciation. Um, so that's a, an interesting way of using TED Talks um, as, a, uh, as a learning source and uh, having students bring information that they got from those talks into the classroom. I, I, sh I should also mention here a slide I find very useful and that is the American um, radio service which is called National Public Radio, NPR. And that is a free site which uh, is a news site and it has on the site audio, news, news talks all of many different kinds on all sorts of different topics. And some of them are very short. And you have both the script and the audio. And sometimes the, the script is not the same as the audio. For example, the audio might be an interview and the script might be a summary of what is said. So you can use those to compare differences between spoken and written English and so on. So that NPR, National Public Radio, is a fabulous source of high interest level short uh, talks on many different topics that um, there's, they're audio, not video. But um, I find them very useful at, uh, as, as a source of out of class learning, students can choose uh, topics on, on a whole variety of current issues, for example, and you can do interesting things with them. So TED Talks and National Public Radio. Um, social media here, 
we'll come to shortly. Let me just get rid of that slide for a second. Um, and of course, for many people, myself not included, social media plays a very important part in their lives and can be used to support um, different forms of language development. Uh, Maria Regini, I think her name is, um, uh, describes uh, in one of the sources that I'll give you how social media can be used to develop skills needed to read authentic texts and news articles from the electronic media. And she directs students to articles on the BBC News and so on. Um, and students have to choose one a week and um, read them. And a teacher creates a blog where students upload comments on their chosen news article and comment on the posts from their peers. Um, then I've got one here that I will skip because we're a little bit short of time. And that uh, is a similar use of um, a blogging and a writing course, which you can read about if you want to um, in, the, in, the, in the paper that I'll refer to you. So the examples I gave there also involve some key features. They involve collaborative learning uh, in the case, of, for example, of the, uh, the digital games that we talked of. Also, in the case of TED Talks or the National Public Radio Talks that I mentioned, you can build in collaborative activities around them. For example, a class wiki where students post their recommendations for TED Talks or uh, radio broadcasts to listen to, along with comments and, and questions for discussion. Um, both the digital games and the TED Talks also involve multimodal sources of input input that involves both visual and oral uh, as well as print um, and um, in the case of digital games in, players are often encountering different kinds of texts often on-screen texts with dialogues between game characters as well as in-game dialogues delivered in English sometimes with subtitles in different languages and again with these kinds of sources unlike classroom based learning which often makes use of limited types of discourse um, and especially written text. The use of listening logs that Betsy talked about, as well as things like TED Talks, introduce learners to authentic language use from different genres and styles of spoken and written discourse. And of course, with the TED Talks and the National Public Radio uh, broadcasts, the learners can listen to them as many times as they like. And now let's say something about um, technology because that is um, so central in the uh, lives of learners and plays such a crucial role in out-of-class learning. One interesting use of technology that um, has been written about uh, is tandem learning, e-mediated tandem learning. And that would be learners in two different countries helping each other learn their language through um, exchanging emails. So, for example, a student in California learning Japanese might be in touch with a student in Japan learning English. And during their exchanges, they talk about topics of mutual interest, such as school life and cultural activities, for example. And the student in uh, the United States learning Japanese would be communicating in Japanese and vice versa. And during these exchanges, they may pose questions give clarification, ask for suggestions, and so on, and also give feedback to each other on the appropriateness of their language use. And um, they may also perhaps keep a journal that could be shared with a teacher in which they might write about um, their partner's language use as well as reflect on this process of tandem learning. So it's a kind of one step beyond pen pals, really, isn't it? Tandem learning. Uh, <clears throat> Some colleagues uh, have uh, described uh, how they use an online program to improve their learners' speaking skills in preparation for the Cambridge Proficiency Exam, CPE. They made use of the online program VoiceThread to enable the students to improve their speaking performance. The students were assigned a topic, asked to prepare a short recording on the topic, about two minutes each, and to upload it onto their restricted um, area on VoiceThread. And the teacher um, who used this activity mentions here, once all the recordings have been uploaded, teachers and then will listen to them, record their comments. 
learners would listen to the comments made on their production, record different versions each time, incorporating aspects they considered relevant from their peers or their teachers' feedback. All right. So um, a number of features of these activities, well, they involve peer feedback. They are targeted perhaps to particular aspects of language proficiency and in the case of the tandem learning activity, they acquired not only language but also knowledge of each other's cultures. Those would be some of the key features of those three activities. Now, um, out of class projects, it's, we've often made use of projects in language teaching and as opportunity for learners to use their language resources for an authentic communicative purposes. But uh, technologies extended the opportunities and potentials for project-based learning. And here's a very nice example, again, from two of my colleagues in Hong Kong, which involve the students collaborating on um, a video. A video, and, uh, and this is a course in English for science students, where essentially the students work in groups to do a, a project reporting a scientific experiment on a topic, and then they use a, a video to create a scientific documentary which they upload to YouTube and they share through a publicly accessible course blog. There I will leave you to read the description of it while I read your comments that are coming in here. So let's just take a minute there. Time is a bit tight, I see Alice is telling me, but I will be uh, sticking to the schedule. You'll be relieved to know. So um, that's the video documentary that um, that uh, my colleagues in uh, Hong Kong talked about. And another teacher I've worked with uh, in Singapore, um, Su Lian Lim, uh, have, has students prepare a video on a social issue of their choice in the form of a public service announcement that they would include in a final class presentation. So we'll skip the that re really here. Um, but it's so similar to the, the project I described earlier. Um, one of the things about an activity of this kind is what you might call learner validity. It makes use of something that learners do in their everyday lives, uh, involves them in using technology in ways that reflect their out-of-class practices, and it involves collaborative and autonomous learning. The last examples I want to share with you have to, you have to do with using television as a learning resource. And um, that's, of course, something we've done for many years. But there are now new ways, I think, of thinking about the use of television. Anthony Hanf describes a strategy he calls resourcing. I think he works here in Korea, which involves the viewer taking notes on words or expressions that they wish to learn using the subtitles as they watch um, a television broadcast in the target language um, and um, a script that's been translated into their native language. So which aid to comprehension they use will depend on the level of the learner. They can also control their learning experience, pausing a scene as often as they liked in order to understand it. He calls this um, resourcing skills as they're able to catch longer streams of language with less difficulty. So it's a bilingual um, approach. Um, a couple of colleagues in Hong Kong have written about internet television. Uh, that is uh, television delivered through smartphones, tablets, and so on, which the learner can take with them wherever they go, uh, accessing their favorite program and so on. So making use of what would traditionally be dead time on the subway, for example, through watching television programs in English. And another colleague um, talks about the use of what he calls extensive viewing. That is a bit like extensive reading, regular, silent, uninterrupted viewing of television, both inside and outside the classroom, as means of improving vocabulary. And he talks about, this is Stuart Webb here, it's now in Canada, watching different episodes. I'll leave you to read that here while I look at some of your comments that are coming in. All right, so some of the features there of the television, of course, it's accessible, intensity of exposure, motivational, 
flexibility, multimodal television providing input in several forms, and also uh, when students watch television, they can notice gaps in their speech. I was traveling uh, a while ago with a young teacher from Iran who told me how he used to he almost memorize scripts from uh, soap operas and other television programs that he watched and that he learned a huge amount of idiomatic English through comparing how the speakers in the, in the television series said things with the way he would have tried to say them himself. This idea of noticing gaps in your own um, English through watching television. Now, just to start to draw things to a close here, because um, we've got 45 minutes and then we've got the time for discussion. Some of the activities that I've talked about, they differ in, in a number of ways. They differ in terms of where they happen, whether they are involving speech or writing, what modality, what their learning aims might be, whether they're intentional, incidental, or very focused. Uh, who's in control? Is it something the teacher does? What type of interaction? Is it one way or two way? Language register, scripted, unscripted. Um, the logistics, how simple or demanding they are. What the demands of the task were in what manner they uh, they take place and what means they make use of. So, you know, they, they, they differ in a, in a number of different ways. They have a, lots of benefits for learners, and those are some of the points that we've talked about so far. Some of the benefits they offer for second language learning, providing opportunities for learners to do these things. And also they have these kinds of benefits um, or as we call them, affordances, if you like, for language learners. Things that are not always possible to achieve in the classroom. Uh, as well, um, they provide, I think, benefits for uh, teachers, providing opportunities are difficult to create in the classroom, enabling links to be made between classroom and out-of-class learning. So I want to just uh, sort of finish on that note and just uh, recap the point that I made at the beginning, the difference between input and intake. Um, input is anything we receive in English, either inside the classroom and outside of the classroom, but we've been talking about input that students can receive outside of the classroom through the internet, through television, through whatever source they make use of to be exposed to English. That's all input, but it only serves as a source of learning when it becomes intake. In other words, where aspects of it are noticed and stored and remembered and used. And so if we ask ourselves, what is the role of classroom teaching in relation to these activities, it's really to prepare students to be able to use that input as intake. And that's to recap recapitulate what I said earlier on. If students don't have a good basis in English to begin with, a, a reasonable um, foundation, they won't be able to use input as intake. And that, as I said earlier, perhaps explains why students in Northern European countries are able to learn much more from out of class contact with English through the media and so on than students in some parts of the world where students don't learn very much through the public education system, through English and the public education system. Now, that is going to be the last from me. And those are the, um, the, the sources of these articles, uh, the, these studies that I mentioned. And on my website, I also have a paper on this topic, which has the same title as this presentation. If you'd like to read that, just go into my website, and um, which is professorjackridges.com, and look in the section on articles. You'll find this paper that has been published on this topic. Um, and as Alistair mentioned, in my new book, Key Issues in Language Teaching, which just came out a week ago, um, there is a big chapter on a big section on the use of technology. So there we go, folks. There's 120 of you there so far. Glad to see the numbers have not declined during the course of the presentation. They've actually gone up, which is always a relief. I've had to gabble a bit to get through the, the talk in the time allotted, but lots and lots of questions have been coming in. So um, let's see now. Alistair serves as the host here, and let's see if he wants to pick out um, some of the key points. One, Rene is dead, so dense with information, I feel completely snowed down. Fear not, Rene, just go onto my website, uh, which is the, mentioned there, and the article is there. So um, it's all there for you. So I'm sorry, it is a bit of a rush 
but you can now go through and learn in your own time or read and process it in your own time. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks very much, Jack. And just to say also that the recording of today's webinar will be available on our blog um, from Thursday, I believe. So um, if you've missed any parts of it or you want to hear anything that Jack said again, then um, you can go to www.cambridge.org slash ELT slash blog. Um, and yes, we've got lots of questions coming, so we'll move straight on to those. Um, from Rizwana Bari, who says, should all learning beyond the classroom be referred to as experiential learning? And if so, can we say that practicing language in the real context actually paves the way for authentic and long-lasting language learning for most individuals? I, I think I would agree with that. Yeah, that seems like a, quite a nice summary of it. Yeah, I think so. I think I would, I would agree with that. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, a question from Teresa Pereira, who is asking about the language villages that you, you talked about earlier. Um, wonders how those are, tie in with uh, school timetables. They are normally, uh, the ones here in South Korea and Japan are normally scheduled um, in vac during the vacation times. Here in South Korea, for example, there's a big, uh, I believe, a, a big uh, project to, to build, uh, to, to run these language villages on the island of Jeju. But they are um, mainly uh, in uh, holiday time. Yep. Okay, thanks. And um, Christine Sotro Champley asks, who, who organizes them? I think it varies. Um, for example, I, I, I'm not sure how accurate my information is here, but in, um, um, in Japan, uh, outside of Tokyo, there's uh, um, an English village that I think has been organized by Kanda University. And it's in a kind of rural um, vacation setting. And, uh, one goes there and is greeted by English butlers and um, everything's conducted in English and that's a paid paid experience. So I think it really depends. I think in, in South Korea, the villages are organized by the local ministries of education. So they're a government uh, initiative. The ones okay. I mentioned in Spain, I'm not sure whether those are, I think those are just uh, run by private, inst private institutes. Okay, thank you. A question now from Olive Corsol who is talking about asking about the listening logs. And uh, Olive says that um, some of our lower level Chinese students feel they wouldn't know where to start listening and, and what, um, what they should, uh, should be listening for. Um, and Olive feels that there may be a sort of cultural barrier. Um, do you have any suggestions about what to do about such cultural barriers to confidence? Well, I think, I think, um, I think, you'd have to prepare the students for them. I think in that case, more teacher guidance in selecting the kinds of outer class listening experiences that you'd want them to participate in. For example, I think, Olive, the question that comes from Taiwan, does it not? Uh, I'm not sure. But anyway, supposing you found um, a museum of interest that you wanted them to attend. It might be a science museum, for example. Many cities have such a museum. And where there might be guided tours in English. I think you would perhaps want to uh, check that out in advance to find out what is actually said on the, the course of that, uh, that tour um, and um, give them some language support to prepare them for it, some things to note. I mean, you know, hop on, hop off uh, bus tours of cities, which I do in every new city I visit, also are a, a good example of um, uh, out-of-class learning because uh, you've got the commentary recorded commentary in a variety of different languages, but you're there, you're looking around you, listening to a broadcast, uh, a recording about where you are and so on. So I think it's a question of choosing an activity that is appropriate and appropriate level for the learners and um, giving them any support that they might need. Start with something fairly simple. Okay, I've got a question please, now. Could we, yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry, no, go on. No, sorry, please, 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 sorry, go on. I was going to say, I mean, if, for example, if, if, if it's uh, television, watching television could be just, you know, watching some television advertisements and um, checking some of the words and phrases that you hear on short TV commercials. Okay, thanks. Um, question from Andrea Zibung, who's interested in the interviews that you were talking about earlier um, and wonders whether these would work as well, or what the problems were would be trying these in rural areas rather than sort of larger cities and tourist areas where it would seem more obviously clear that would, that, that would work well? Uh, well, in rural areas, I'm not sure who you would be able to interview. That would be the only catch. Um, 
you could, of course, interview members of the community who are fluent in English, because even in a rural area, there might be um, businesses or whatever. They, they needn't be interviewing native speakers, but they could be doing interviews with um, people in the, in the community of different kinds, you know, the, the mayor or somebody in a hospital, whatever, asking them about their job, what they do, and so on. So I think even in rural areas, you could find potential uh, candidates for interviews and prepare the students with some simple interview questions and interview people who'd be willing to be interviewed in English. So um, that could be that could work quite well, I would think. Okay, thanks. Um, question now from Adele Jebel, who'd like you to say a bit more about your new book, please. Oh, well, I'm always delighted to do a bit of free promotion. Thank you very much. Um, I mentioned this actually earlier in one of the webinars. This is a big book. It's 850 pages long, so it uh, can serve as an excellent doorstop if you can't find another use for it. It's a, sur it's a survey, it's an overview, uh, my view of the field really. I think it's got is it 19 or 21, maybe 21 chapters looking at every aspect, you know, teaching of reading, writing, grammar, professional development, um, methodology and so on. And each chapter has got vignettes from teachers from around the world that share their experience on issues related to each chapter. There's also an ebook version of it, and in the ebook, I uh, I did a video interview to each of the chapters, and also I did a series of interviews with uh, key specialists in different areas, um, and those occur in the ebook as well. So this this is called Key Issues in Language Teaching, and just came out a couple of weeks ago. So um, I hope you'll find it a useful resource. There are discussion questions, tasks, and so on. I really planned it as the basis for uh, a postgraduate course, really. Uh, that's how I've used it myself. So it's, it's really the basis of a postgraduate or MA course. OK, thanks. Thanks very much, Jack. Um, a question from um, Monica Papp now, um, a very pertinent one. Um, Monica asks, how do you see the future of learning a language in a class? Is it going to go out, going to go out of fashion? Um, I don't think so, but I think I, I think um, the re resources we make use of in the classroom will become increasingly linked to out-of-class um, learning experiences. I see May Sui Tan. What is the title of the book? Key issues in language teaching. May. Um, no, I don't think it will do because um, you know schools, uh, public education is uh, is here to stay, and so um, English will always be part of the curriculum of um, public education. So classroom-based learning will, always, will be here as long as, as public education is here. Um, it's just the nature of uh, classroom learning is, is going to change, going to um, be more dependent on linked to opportunities to learn outside of the classroom. Textbooks, likewise, are already beginning to make more and more use of uh, online components. Hey, thanks. Um, question now from Andrew Ferguson, who's um, asking about the differentiation between input and intake. Um, says that uh, input doesn't just flow through. There is intake in all inputs. Without initial input, there can be no intake. Was, is that accurate, or do you have? Uh, is there any way, you, um, any sort of source you can suggest that will explain this in more detail? Um, I think that's fairly uh, accurate. Chris uh, Richard Schmidt is published quite a, a lot about this notion of input and intake because his, um, his theory of noticing argues that input becomes intake. One of the ways it becomes intake is through noticing. The noticing hypothesis argues that you won't learn anything from input unless you notice something about it. So in other words, exposure is not enough. You have to be consciously aware of the way language is used and, that, and through this noticing, input can become intake. So. I mean, if you want some fairly heavy, uh, detailed discussion of the distinction between input and intake, I would recommend looking at some of uh, Richard Schmidt's work on the noticing hypothesis, which is sort of discussed in most standard textbooks on uh, second language acquisition. Okay, thanks. Um, a question now from Olga Pogorilova. Um, Pog Sorry, uh, I'll put, um, Olga Pogorilova. Who asks whether any particular types of any particular chat rooms you'd recommend for um, for language use? Um, well, the trouble is there are so many of them; they change all the time. Perhaps other participants who can who are members of chat rooms can tell us um, what uh, chat rooms they uh, currently um, uh, participate in. Um, I'm probably a little bit out of date, but I noticed that. Um, 
uh, other participants here are posting notices about that. I'd like uh, to invite those of you who do partake, uh, uh, participate in chat rooms to uh, post the ones that you, you find most useful. There are so many out there, really. All right? Yeah, so please, please do that, people. And uh, those of you who are already, that's great. Thanks. Um, another question from Rizwana Bari, who asks, um, how authentic and effective would the exchange of languages between two learners be um, with e-mediated tandem learning? Should we do away with um, focusing on accuracy of language in this case and focus instead on the provision of background information for the sake of learners' language fluency? Well, um, interestingly, in the um, case study that is reported in I think it's uh, the Benson and, and Reinders book there, which uh, talks about this tandem learning of these uh, uh, between students in Japan and, and students in the United States. Accuracy is one of the things that um, actually uh, they, they do talk about. In other words, the Japanese learner would be commenting on the accuracy of the American student's use of English, uh, use of Japanese, and vice versa. So, so it's, it wasn't merely simply cultural exchange and fluency. Um, language accuracy does have a strong focus, or can have a strong focus in those exchanges if the participants choose that as a, a topic of interest, of relevance. So they may well ask, you know, please correct my Japanese, please correct my English. Would I, should I say it this way? Should I say it that way? So no reason why accuracy couldn't become um, a strong focus of tandem learning. Thanks. Um, question now from Victoria Ostenkova, who asks whether you've got any particular recommendations for resources um, for doing this with younger learners, very young learners. Not really, I'm afraid. Um, most of the case studies that are, uh, are written in these two books are with teenage or adult learners. I don't know okay. that um, I've got anything I can recommend specifically there. Okay. Um, Sorry about that, Victoria. Um, Margaret Perucci has a question. Um, she, you mentioned earlier some software that monitors pronunciation, I think. And um, Margaret was wondering what the name of that software was. Yes, just um, go on to the next question while I track that down for you. Okay. Uh, Thanks. Voice, voice, voice thread, I think it's called. Ah, voice thread. Yes. Voice, that was. Yes, voice thread. Mm -hmm. Okay, brilliant. Thanks. Um. Question now from Christine, who's asking about um, resources and ha uh, how um, how one assesses assesses those the, the resources that uh, that we've been talking about. Um, I think particularly the outputs from them. Not quite clear of the focus of that question. If you could run it through again, uh, what do you mean by the resources there? Okay, um, Christine, could you possibly just type into the, uh, Christine is typing into the chat to clarify that. I suspect okay. it may have been garbled in my my uh, <laughs> yeah, discussion of it. That would help. Thanks. So Christine is is typing now. Um, oh, yes, by the way. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Somebody's talked about a, an app that facilitates language exchanges called Hello Talk. There's Olive has sent in a reference there. Very useful to get these um, these um, comments from participants here. Right. Yeah, okay. So Christine's clarified she was thinking about sort of levels for, for television, for instance, and, and radio. Um, how do you as assess the levels of, of the content that the users are going to be, the learners are going to be using? You mean when you're recommending, um, for example, a TED talk or um, a radio talk from the listener? I think you'd have to make that assessment yourself. Um, yeah. As to whether you think the you know the level is appropriate, um, you'd have to do a sort of uh, um, you know a trial yourself to see that if you, if it's too difficult or too, you know for the students to cope with. Um, I don't think there's any other yeah. way of doing that I can think of. Mm. Okay, thanks. We'll finish off with just one one final question. Um, you mentioned that uh, virtual classes you didn't think would ever fully replace face-to-face -face classes. Do you think that blended learning will therefore be a regular feature of our future language classrooms? I do, um, because uh, if we don't provide opportunities for students to make use of the resources of the internet, we're really denying them uh, opportunities that, uh, that are there and um, denying them access to a, a very powerful learning resource. So. Uh, certainly seems to be the, 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 the way things are moving. So ways of finding uh, links between classroom learning and out-of-class learning 
linking online and distance learning with classroom learning seems to be essential simply because in most countries you cannot provide sufficient face-to-face uh, -face classroom learning to satisfy the huge demand for language instruction. It's simply physically impossible. You know, m many countries can only provide three or four hours a week of input of classroom-based language learning. So there's no way you can really develop an advanced level of proficiency with three or four hours input a week. So, mm -hmm. you know, the only solution is to really flip the classroom and provide the, uh, to make the classroom a preparation for out-of-class learning. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Jack. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. But don't forget, everyone, that Jack's book, Key Issues in Language Teaching, is out now as a paperback and soon as an e-book. And um, we'll paste the link once again into the chat um, right now. Um, we're back this afternoon in just five hours' time, actually, for another webinar when Anne Robinson will be talking about moving and flying with your course book, about teaching young learners for the Cambridge English Young Learners tests. Then next week, we're joined by Steph de Monbayer, who will be exploring the benefits of self and peer assessment, formative assessment as well as part of a learning-oriented cycle, and suggesting some practical classroom techniques to help your learners become more independent. You can sign up for both of those by visiting our events page, um, cambridge.org slash ELT events. The recording of today's webinar should be live on our blog and YouTube channel on Thursday, and we'll send you a certificate next week. And you should all now have received certificates for the last three webinars. So thank you very much, everyone, for attending, and particularly thanks to you, uh, Jack, for another fascinating session. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. All the best. Thanks.